Welcome to Lund. Here we are at the very southernmost tip of Sweden. Beautiful agricultural land. Over there is the Sound, Öresund, and on the other side is Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark. I can just about see it. And let me show you. Here is the old city of Lund. The university is down there, about 350 years old. The city is there with its old cathedral. And my grandfather was born there. So was my father, so was I. I went to school there, I went to university. I've been professor there for more than 25 years. So of course, I know a thing in two about the university and the town. If you're interested, come with me and I'll show you some interesting places and we'll talk about some fascinating people. <music> This is where it started. A cold winter day, January 1668. The university was inaugurated in the cathedral. Lots of dignitaries had come from Stockholm and they had a long inauguration of the university. At the time, Lund was a very small, insignificant city. It had been important at the late Viking days, but then it had declined. Copenhagen had taken over. There was almost nothing left, more than small houses and the cathedral here in Lund. But the university ended up the professors, the one got from all kinds of places, primarily from the cathedral school. And from the beginning, they were housed in the cathedral. The lectures were given there. Then one bought a number of good Germans to come in. Foremost of them was Samuel Pufendorf. He was a son of the 30th war in Germany. He'd seen what the fights between Protestants and Catholics could lead to. And he thought the only way to get peace was by law. So he was a proponent of natural law, but he wrote a very important book after just a few years here in Lund. It was the book from Lund which became the most read for centuries. So the university had a good start in the 1660s. Teaching and everything went on until the big collapse. Everything went bust. From being a successful university, nothing worked for about 40, 50 years. And to understand that, we need to go to some other place, a bit further south from here. In the beginning of the 18th century, this was by far the nicest house in town. So when the king came here, he took it over and moved in here. The king was Charles XII, one of the Swedish warrior kings. He had tried to conquer Russia, but failed and lost his army. He had spent years in exile in the Ottoman Empire, and now he was back. And he decided to settle in Lund because it was close to Denmark, and he wanted to wage more war. To understand this situation, we need to think a bit about where we are. This is Danish Viking land. It was lost to Denmark at the end of the 30th war when the Swedes took it over. Of course, the Danes didn't like that, and they tried to come back. So 10 years after the university had been founded, they were back with a big army. It was a big battle outside Lund, the Swedes won, but it was the beginning of a period of wars where Lund burnt, then it burnt again, then there was the plague, and the king. And you can understand, a king like that, any able-bodied young man who wanted to be a student didn't want to be here, because if the king saw them, he would send them into the army. He stayed about two years, then he went up, tried to conquer Norway as a way of 
defeating Denmark, but he was shot. Leaving the University of Lund in a pitiable state. It had been opened, closed, opened, closed, opened. So it was still in existence, but it was very small, it was very poor. We are back at square one. Let's return to the cathedral. The town is devastated. There is a university, but just about. To then describe what happened, the slow development forward, let's use Linnaeus, the famous Swedish botanist. Linnaeus came to Lund to study medicine. Actually, there was one professor at that time of medicine, but he was away, and Linnaeus could stay with his substitute. At that time, the lectures were not held anymore in the cathedral, but they moved up to this house. It was the only thing, more or less, that the university owned at that time. Here was the pit. Linnaeus has described it was a problem with there were so many pigs here. And actually, you, nothing was good here. The lectures were not good. And after about one year, Linnaeus disappeared up to Uppsala, closer to the court in Stockholm. And up there, he became famous. About 20 years later, he was on a kind of official trip describing this province. And he came to Lund, and he described what had happened here. First of all, this beautiful park had been planted. There was a wall keeping out the pigs, and the house had been renovated, and now the lectures and everything could be held in there. So it was not just the park that had been nicely built here. One had built, on the other side of the building, a real botanical garden, in here teaching, library, and on the top of the tower, one had astronomical instruments. One also had good teachers. The first ones who actually started to teach in Swedish. And they were progressive. There was a local academy of science that was started at that time. So one can say at the end of the 18th century, there really was a university in Lund. It really functions. It had a good future. But so far, we haven't talked about the students. What about them? Early September morning, 1829, the body was found lying in the street. The student wasn't drunk. He was dead. His head had been battered in and there was blood all over the place. One could follow the strains of the blood because the body had been carried there, and all the stains went into this room. And when the police knocked on the door, the door was opened by Jakob Blomstrand, the student in there, and he was obviously the killer. He had blood all over him. He confessed. It was under academic jurisdiction, so the rector, the vice-chancellor of the university, he was the one who signed the death warrant. And Blomstrand was beheaded north of Lund. Why did he do it? We really don't know. Maybe there was a quarrel over girls. Maybe they were just drunk. He may have been mad. We don't really know. But this tragic event put a focus on the life of the students, which was quite miserable. There were about two, three hundred students in Lund at the time, many of them sons of local clergymen, others sons of farmers. Most of them were poor, not enough to eat. Many of them drank too much. There were few things for them to do. One thought one needed more content, intellectual content in their life. So one decided in 1830 to start an academic society. They had a house right over here where they could have some newspapers, more of discussions, some better food to eat. 
and it became a great success. 20 years later, one thought, we must have a bigger house. So one built a big castle, a castle to use in Lingaboria. Internationally, this was the time of the romantic image of the student, glorifying male youth. Here, Scandinavism was important, trying to join the forces of Sweden, Denmark, Norway. And most of the time, the students in here, they did things like organizing men's choir, they had plays. Every fourth year, they had a big carnival here in Lund. So, the students have a big, beautiful building. What is the reaction of the university? In 1882, the university inaugurated this big building. It showed its strength. The 19th century had been peaceful for Sweden and that had been good for the university. The experimental sciences got new buildings and a huge hospital complex was started together with the university just north of here. This is about the time when we start having Lund School of this and that and the other. We had Lund School of Theology, later we have of Astrophysics, and we had of Poetry. Here in front, the old botanic garden was moved to a much better place, and the fountain was built. It's all very pretty, while inside one made it really pompous. So in here, we had the lecture rooms, where the lectures for the various faculties were held. In this big atrium was the place where the academic teachers, together with the bishop and the rector, and processions to and from the cathedral started. So we have a solid and good Swedish university. It helps build modern Sweden, the state, industry, civil society. The danger is it's getting more and more conventional and state. But as with every good university, the forces of change came from inside. Now we need to go out into town. The city of Lund had a tremendous development at the second half of the 19th century. Most importantly, the railway came and the old city wall, the bulwark, around the medieval town was broken through. Traffic could flow. New Jugendstyle houses were built. To talk more about that, let's move a bit in that direction. To follow this modernizing development in the university, I can tell you about two children to two professors, local professors here. The first was Hilma Borelius. Her father was professor of philosophy. She was one of the first women students here, and she was the very first woman to defend a thesis, in this case in Swedish literature. She did a lot to improve the situation of women students. She helped create a society for women students here at the university, which later helped build this very house, which is like a college for women students. The thing that she wanted was respect. Respect for those women who went into academia. Nothing more, nothing less. Bengt Liedfors, the other professor's child. He was born in this house. His father was professor of modern languages. He was a brilliant student, a brilliant academic. He became professor of botany, but he was a very problematic character. 
It was considered immoral and dangerous, but he was also an excellent writer, particularly against authority, against the church. He was loved and he was hated. Those that loved him were mainly the workers because he joined the Social Democratic Party as the first academic. And we have pictures of him on the very square where we started, where he stands and agitates to the workers. But he also did other things. One of the things was that he wrote popular science essays for the local social democratic press. So, Hilma Borelius and Ben Klitfos together, they tried to open up the university world. They become a very important force in the modernizing of the university. Words are what universities produce. Words are consumed in the universities, but they also leak out into society. The role that the students played in the 20s for taking words from the university, we will now talk about. In 1920, the students started their own student magazine called Lundago. And that became very important because it became a hothouse for good writers, editors and writers. And they had a certain style. They were very often good storytellers. They could be poets. And the most famous of them internationally was Franz G. Bengtsson, who wrote about in Swedish, Rødeau, and translated into English, for example, The Longships, about a Viking who went all over the world. His style was characteristic from the world. It was actually very learned, but it was hidden learning. And one can say that he illustrated this kind of loon spirit of taking fun very seriously and the series with a bit of fun. We see this, for example, in the students when they had their carnivals, they made a lot of fun of the Nazis in Germany, just south of here. However, soon afterwards, they realized, no, the Nazis was not anything you could make fun of. We stand at the grave of Clora Paul, a German gynecologist, doctor, who came to Lund in 1939 and died. The same year, her husband died also in Lund, and they are buried here. By remembering them, we can talk about what happened in Lund during the Second World War. They married late, 1924, the same year as he became professor of anatomy in Hamburg. But 10 years later, he was sacked because he was Jewish. In 1939, he knew he had to try to escape Germany. And he came here in Lund. Three days later, he had a heart attack and died. So Clara came here to bury him. We have no photographs of them available, but he left all his papers, since he went into exile here in Lund with us. The first thing I think of when I see the Paul papers is what a fortunate place Lund was during the Second World War. The war never came here. Most of the students were actually away. They were defending Swedish neutrality. The university reacted in different ways, so we can follow the swings by looking at the histories of Clara and Heinrich. In spring 1939, the local student union voted against immigration of German Jewish doctors. They didn't want them here. However, slightly later, Heinrich was invited by colleagues, and some of them regarded as extremely German friendly. We know that Lund greeted later thousands of refugees coming over from Denmark, in particular Jews, 
in connection with Denmark was occupied. I think it would be fair to say that most people just tried to survive in difficult times. Let the storms blow over and try to come back later. After Heinrich's funeral, Clara went back to Berlin, came back at the end of August. We were in 1939. She visited his grave here, went back to the hotel and committed suicide. She left a poem for their joint grave. It's about, in German, it's Unsterblichkeit, living forever. For her, it was better to believe in the future of the souls together than to live in September 1939. After the Second World War, in almost all countries, the um, way to run university changed. There was an interest of getting more people into universities from all kinds of societies. So there was expansion. That happened in Sweden too. Particularly since at that time we had the Swedish model, the Swedish welfare state, actually led by a number of radicals that had been coming from Lund in an earlier decade. So opened up more groups coming to university and in particular, women. There were not many, but there was a fair proportion of women coming to university. And when you have women and when you have men together, you get children. And you see here in the 40s how the student union started their own crash. And the academic society built new student housing. Here we have an example of nice 50s building, Actually, I know them well because I lived, I lived up in that room a couple of years. Very nice, in particular, since there was this garden, and in the garden there sat a beautiful girl who later became my girlfriend and wife. But this expansion of getting more students into universities didn't, of course, just have to do with the student and student housing but it also had to do with the university itself. And then we need to get out of the center of town, further to the north, where we had the large expansion. In the 50s and 60s, with more students coming to university, it became more and more, one could say, technocratic. It was just a question of numbers, getting students in, getting students out as rapidly as possible. And after a while, the students themselves really felt that, is that all there is to it? So, we're approaching 1968. And the demands that the students had, I must say, they are still with me. No war research. Possible for students of all kinds, independent of economic means, to come to universities and then it should also be a certain freedom for students to study over faculty bounds. Those freedoms, ideas that I got out of 68, they're still with me. And they influence the way I look at universities today. Up here in the north of Lund was built a whole new technical faculty. And I know it well, because this is where I started to study mathematics. In that room over there, I had my first exams. Expansion, but not just expansions in numbers, also very good quality. Here, Lars Hermander was professor at the time. He was the one who's got a Fields Prize in mathematics, which is about like the Nobel Prize. He was the son of a local school teacher who was sent to Lund to study, had the advantage of having an interesting teacher belonging to the famous Hungarian traditional mathematicians called Marcel Ries. He had come to Lund 
and was the teacher of Hermanda, who wrote about partial differential equations and became world famous for that. With good mathematics, good technology, good natural science, we also got a new science park outside here, the Ideon. A lot of mobile telephones, a lot of biotechnology has started out there. In some sense, most exciting and most weird is the thing we have right outside the windows here. A, a fountain, a non-functioning fountain. The architect for this campus area, he had a friend who was a sculptor and they decided they should build a real big fountain here. So they built this huge thing. There were containers and they pumped up water and then the water flowed down into the ponds over here. The problem was it didn't work. It broke, the glass wasn't strong enough. So in the end, one had to decide, no, it can't be used. So it's been standing. Now it is the non-functioning fountain. And one can take it as a bit of a symbol for a good university. Fascinating ideas, but unfortunately, well, it didn't really work. Okay, so we do something else about it. Now, we need to end this story. And to do that, we go even further north, back to the hills north of Lund, where we started. There are so many people we haven't had time to talk about. There are so many places we haven't visited. There's the Botanical Garden, which is both romantic and scientific. There's the Museum for Public Art, fantastic murals from all over the world and sculptures. And down here, we have Max Four, a cyclotron source for light to look at the structure of matter. But enough is enough. We've come back to one of the hills north of Lund to get, try to get an overview. And this is the ideal spot. Because we can almost see Helsingborg and we certainly can see Malmö, where Lund now has extra campuses. I see. Fantastic school of music, for example, over at Malmö. And down here was the Battle of Lund, where 10,000 men were slaughtered, just a few years after the founding of the university. But one shouldn't get fooled by those events like wars or the pest or when Lund burned. The exciting things about a university town, there's youth, there's concentration on knowledge, both creating new ones and transmitting it. And that makes it a very exciting milieu to be in. And the life of a university. It was there last year, it was there yesterday, it's there today, and it will be there tomorrow. Personally, I look forward to tomorrow.